Want to build a simple project from concept to custom PCB with our own enclosure using the new mesh technology from Particle? Well, check out this series of videos starting with our overall system architecture and benchtop prototype using the Argon, Xenon, and the new Particle Workbench development environment. Well, welcome to this video, which I'm really excited to start through because we're going to develop our first IoT product and there's going to be a whole series of videos that are going to take us end to end from the concept and problem statement all the way down to a finished product that we can mass produce. So let's get started. First of all, I want to talk through the build stages that we're going to go through as a part of this. And the first thing we always want to really start out with, once we've got our problem statement and we know what it is we want to build or what it is we're trying to solve with our product, is some type of a system architecture or block diagram. And then, once we've got that laid out, um, I typically move right to picking out the various parts and pieces that I think we're going to need to build and actually build a benchtop prototype. Once we've done that, we're going to do firmware development and actually get software running on this hardware, on this smart device, and make sure that everything works as expected. And we're going to use Particle Workbench to do this. And I'll talk briefly about how you can get it and uh, sign up for it and use it. I love it. Also, we're going to create the enclosure for our benchtop prototype, and that'll be using Onshape. So Onshape is a 3D modeling tool that's available on the web, and you can use it from home as long as you're not using it to build a business or to do something commercial, as it's non-commercial, I believe it is free for you to use. And what I love about Onshape is all of its capabilities. You don't have any software that you need to install, and you can even use it on your iPad or iPhone. I've actually been modeling using it just sitting at a bus stop and uh, I think uh, you'll find it uh, very impressive. Once we have an enclosure, we're gonna need to print it, and we'll use a 3D printer to do that. I have a couple here in the lab. We have Dremels, which are awesome, and we also have a Lulzbot TAS-5, which I love as well because that's a dual extruder, and that will allow us to print things with support structure, and we can have one of the uh, filaments actually be a dissolvable filament that we can just dissolve in water because I really hate cutting out um, support structure. Um, we're going to need to do communication testing because this product that we're going to talk about is actually using mesh networking and it's going to need to communicate over several distances, large distances, relatively large distances, and also uh, through walls and so forth. So we're going to need to do that. <clears throat> and also, one of these devices is not going to be uh, able to be plugged into power all the time. So it's going to need to go to sleep, and we're going to have to manage all of the sleep uh, modes, both in the firmware, but also we want to measure all that and see how long it's going to last on a battery. Of course, once we get through all that, then we're going to think about going to getting a PCB built. And so we're going to do the PCB, PCB development right here in-house. Um, I'm going to recommend that we use Eagle. Uh, primarily because Eagle, although you do have to download software for it and it is a subscription, um, it's relatively inexpensive for two-layer, four-layer boards, and um, it has a huge community. And I find that a community that's large is sometimes critical for us to be able to research if something's not right and get something working quickly. Uh, so we'll be using Eagle for our schematic design, and of course we'll be using Eagle for the printed circuit board layout. And then of course we're gonna actually make the prototype boards right here in-house. So we have a Volterra V1, and I'll have the link down in the description for that as well. And uh, that's where we can literally print, almost like a 3D printer, silver ink onto a substrate, which is the printed circuit board traces and so forth. We can do vias with rivets, and we can actually use solder paste um, that goes down by the Volterra and place the parts <clears throat> and then reflow them. So I'm excited to show that in a video as part of this process. And then, of course, once we've done our printed circuit board, we're going to need to go back and redo our enclosure because now our enclosure isn't enclosing the benchtop prototype. It's enclosing our new 
uh, device that's much smaller footprint that uses our new PCB, and we'll use Onshape for that. And then we're gonna wanna look at, you know, what if we wanna build 50 of these in-house uh, before we go out? And so we can do that. We can easily 3D print 50 enclosures, I think, as we talk through this. Um, and uh, we'll be using a benchtop desktop pick and place machine uh, to actually do this. And uh, I don't have it yet, but by the time we get to this, I hope to. And then finally, we'll need to do some product costing. You know, what is this product gonna cost once it's over a thousand units? And how would it actually be built? Would, is it, you know, what are the design for manufacturing issues associated with it? And uh, how can we do it as an injection molded piece? And we, uh, I really like Fictive for this. Um, and so we can talk about who they are and what they do and the services they offer and work through that process. So in this first video, um, we're gonna start out with our problem statement. We're gonna work on our system architecture. We are going to build the benchtop prototype and we are going to get an introduction to particle workbench so that we can actually write the firmware for our prototype. And finally, once we do all that, we wanna make sure that the data that we're pulling is actually successfully going to the cloud. So let's talk about what problem I'm trying to solve. So where I live, I live here in the city of Chicago and I live near the lake and I'm in a condo or high rise there. And one of the things I find is, you know, I, I'm not sure what I need to wear when I head out the door. And I usually don't really think about it until I get to the coat closet and I'm like, uh, damn, I'm, I don't know uh, what the temperature is outside. And of course I could get back in out of the coat closet and back in the living room and ask Siri what the temperature is, but Siri's gonna tell me what the temperature is at O'Hare, which is not where I'm even close to, and temperatures can vary quite a bit along the lake, both warmer in the summer, cooler in the winter, and so forth. I wanna know what the temperature is right outside my condo. And so that is the problem statement that we're going to solve. And this is the system architecture that I've sort of put together for this. So first of all, over here on the left-hand side, we can see that we um, have, um, first of all, I'm, I'm sort of predefining that I'm gonna use the particle ecosystem. So I'm using the xenons and argons for this. And if you're interested in how to onboard these devices and get them started, I have videos uh, that I will link to that will take you through that. But these are the new products from Particle that are doing low energy Bluetooth mesh networking. And what I love about that is that if I uh, have a low energy Bluetooth device such as this Xenon here, and it's communicating in this case with a temperature sensor, and we'll talk a little bit about why I picked this temperature sensor uh, going forward. But the point is, is that if this Xenon gets this information and then it has to go over back here to the Argon, the argon is actually in my coat closet. So in the coat closet, I have the argon and it's talking to basically some type of display. <clears throat> in this case, I have the SSD 1306, which is basically an OLED display, um, but it could be any type of display that we wanted to do. And this device is always plugged in, so it's always got power. And this is where I walk into the coat closet and I just literally, the display right there shows me what the temperature is outside. And so I don't have to worry about, um, you know, am I grabbing the right jacket and so forth. And I don't have to grab my phone and I don't have to go out and ask somebody. It's just literally right there in my face and super easy. Now, what I don't know is when I put the Xenon outside on the deck or the patio, that essentially it has to get through some very thick winterized double pane glass, sliding glass doors. And so I'm, I believe I'm gonna lose uh, quite a bit of um, amplitude for the radio uh, as I go through this. And uh, I also then, once I get into the condo, I'm gonna have to go through another wall that gets to the coat closet. So it's probably the case that this connection from here to here isn't gonna make it. And that uh, the way we solve that is, well, we just get another Xenon, plug it in somewhere in between, and it acts as a router or gateway or repeater between this Xenon and this Argon, and we're good to go. So this is the system architecture that I've come up with, and we're gonna build all this, and build it eventually from a benchtop prototype to actually building it as though it were something that was gonna be a production thing that we were gonna sell. So first of all, I've looked at you know, various temperature sensors. To be honest with you, I went into the drawer here in the lab and I found an MCP9808. I already had it from Adafruit. It's already breadboarded on a breadboard for me to use. 
And I thought, well, let's just use this um, to move forward. Now, interestingly, though, it does have a lot of great characteristics as we work through the data sheet that are sort of critical um, for our, our product. So for example, here we see that it goes from negative 40 C up to 125 C. That's plenty of range for what I need here in Chicago. And some other places it says negative 20 to 100. Again, all of that is totally fine. One thing though is that the device that's outside um, is, does not have access to power. So it is going to need to conserve power by sleeping a lot and um, work off battery. And so therefore this shutdown current or uh, mode in which when you're sleeping, it's using very little power of 0.1 microamps pretty good. So I think that's, that's gonna be acceptable for what we're trying to do. The other thing that I like is without reading all the words on this, you can actually set a temperature boundary. So let's say it's 72 degrees out and I wanna go to sleep and I don't really wanna measure temperature again unless the temperature has changed by one or two degrees in either direction. So for example, I could say it's 72 now, I'm gonna set it to be 71 to 73 as my boundary conditions, put it to sleep, and only if it exceeds or moves past those boundary conditions is it gonna wake me up. And it'll do that through an interrupt. And um, that I wanna really experiment with as well, rather than just waking up every minute or every five minutes or whatever, is only wake up when the temperature changes. So if we look at the data sheet, you know, I, I usually try to go down, find the power section, which is over here in the power supply, and we see that the typical operating current is 200 microamps, which is good uh, as well when we're actually reading and using the chip, but uh, we're down to 0.1 microamps when we're sleeping. So I like that. The other thing is it comes in some really small form factors. So as we try to get this thing down to some very small little puck that would measure temperature, um, size of these things matter. And so these are uh, both eight pin, one's a DFN where the uh, pins are sort of underneath the chip. And then the uh, MSOP eight pin version has them sort of sticking out on the side. I'm gonna use this version in the lab because I just feel like it's gonna be a little bit easier to solder and debug and so forth rather than having things buried. But in a production environment, we might use uh, the DFN package. And if we look at the various uh, pins on it, um, there's three pins here we're just gonna tie to ground because we don't need multiple slave addresses for I2C. It is an I2C device. And by the way, if you don't know about I2C, I have a I2C in three minute vid video that I will have linked here that you can check out and sort of get the cliff notes for. And um, so we're gonna use SDA and SCL. And then here's this alert pin and this alert pin is what's gonna interrupt us when uh, a boundary condition is changed. And also, if we're gonna build these things in the lab, we really need to be careful about pitch of the pins themselves. So the Volterra uh, is already, its minimum pitch that we can really tolerate is 0.5 um, millimeters. And so with that, I've looked at both the DFN, uh, which is right here, though usually uh, will indicate right here um, the actual distance <clears throat> on center between the two pins. And we have uh, the little letter E here, which we then come down to the table, we find it and we find out that it is uh, 0.5. I would prefer that to have been bigger, at least for initial testing. Unfortunately, that's not what it is. The other one, the, interestingly, the MSOP version is not any different. It's also 0.5. So we're gonna work through that and uh, I, you know, don't like to build things where I'm right on the edge of the limits of the tools that I have, but we'll give it a try and see where we get. Um, the other thing is we need to make sure this part's actually really readily available and it's not end of life and, and it's something that we can put in our product and use for many years to come. And I love Octopart. So I go to Octopart to search all my parts. Uh, what I like about it is it gives you the part from multiple distributors. Um, and it'll also tell you what their stock is, what your minimum order quantity is, and then it gives you a, a feel for pricing. And we can see what it prices out if I'm just buying one versus what if I bought a thousand or 10,000. The other thing I love about it is I can create my own bill of materials right in the website. So I can start adding this in with resistors and other things that we need 
add them all to the same bomb, and it will price them and source them for us. And oh, can't don't forget CAD models. This is awesome. So Octopart is providing 3D CAD models that we can pull right into Eagle, and then Eagle can generate a 3D model of our printed circuit board, which we can then pull into Onshape and put it into our enclosure. It's, it's awesome. Um, and finally, just uh, I want to give you uh, just a little bit of a, if you don't buy these, I think you're crazy because uh, I found these on SparkFun. These are LEDs that you use, you know, you'll just grab an LED and you're going to plug it into your device and you just want to see if something's working. Is it lighting the LED? Maybe your LED is used to indicate an error or whatever. And you always have to grab a, a, another resistor because you need a resistor in series with the LED so that you don't uh, burn the LED out. Well, these guys don't need resistors because they have them built in. So this is awesome. It's a, it's a great time saving and I don't think it adds much more to the cost. I haven't compared it to a standard LED and a resistor, but you know, my time is worth something and this is the way we're going. And so we're going to use these in our uh, bread, uh, benchtop prototype. So with that, Let's go get that benchtop prototype started. Let's get Particle Workbench up and running and build our first temperature measuring device. Okay, so I'm excited to jump in and check out our hardware here, build our benchtop prototype. And typically what uh, I like to do is do some little simple hello world, and this will be a good way to start out using Particle Workbench. So first of all, if we look here at the Xenon, this Xenon is actually already part of a mesh network, and I will have some link to some videos where we put the Xenon on the mesh network so you can see how that works. You'll also notice that rather than me in post having to go remove all these barcodes, I actually do move to light and figured out that I can cover these things up ahead of time, and uh, then I don't have to worry about it after the fact. So that's the only reason that sticker's on there is so the barcode does not get out into the wild, or the QR code, I should say. And I've been advised by Particle it's a potential security risk, so I am gonna cover them up. So in this case, it's breathing cyan, and it's part of the network. And um, let's look at the screen here and start out with one of the things that I wanted to show you, which is uh, Particle Workbench. So, if you just type in Particle Workbench into Safari, you will come up with this web page. Now, this web page is where you want to go to get your preview. And so you'll need to sign up. It will take uh, potentially a day or two for them to get back to you. But once you're signed up, you will have an email that you're part of the alpha and beta testing. And you will then get the links to three files that you are going to install in Visual Studio Code. And I'm a really big proponent of Visual Studio Code. I think that it's fabulous that Particle is moving and creating a development environment for VS Code. VS Code, in my view, is one of the most popular um, uh, development environments, uh, both for Mac, Linux, and Windows. And uh, with all of the extensions, I think it's just, you know, it, it's a great way to go if you can. Um, so visual, you know, thumbs up, big thumbs up to the Particle folks for, for doing that. So what I'm going to do is the way I typically bring up Visual Studio Code once it's installed is I just type code, <clears throat> and this is where it will pop up, uh, and this would be what the sort of the first uh, screen might look like. And when you're going to install those files, uh, just to, I'm not going to go through it here, but um, you can go to the extensions, and then you click on these three dots, and over here you say install from VSIX, and you're going to do that three times for the three files that they give you. You want to reload each time. And when you're done, you will have the whole tool chain on your computer and you'll be ready to go. And at this point, we want to create our first particle project. So we can do shift command P and you'll notice that we get the particle commands um, that we can pick from by just typing particle and it will just filter down to those. And I'm going to do create new project. And it says uh, that we should give it a folder name. So we're going to come up here and I'm going to basically create a new folder called Xenon Temp and open that folder. 
and we'll call this xenon temp sensor and say OK, and we have now created our first project. So the first thing I want to do is just see if this is going to compile correctly and so forth with just the basic set of code that is provided here, which is basically a setup and loop. And so one other thing that we need to do before we can do that is actually uh, configure our workspace. So we'll configure the workspace for the device, and I'll pick 27, which is the latest, and Xenon. And I, this, is, I happen to know, is Xenon number three, and it says that it has successfully configured the workspace and the compiler toolchain is available. And so now I should be able to just build this locally. And the way we do that is through shift command B will bring up these items. Uh, you can also get these uh, through the task, terminal run task or build task. But in this case, uh, use the shortcut. And it says compile application local, we'll pick that and we'll run the compiler. So the compiler is running down below and we'll see if we get a successful compile. And it looks like we did. I didn't see any error messages flying by and it looks like we got an ELF file here which would tell us that we are good to go. So if we're going to do our hello world, what I'm going to do is first of all take all the comments out because if you're watching these videos, you know that I'm assuming you've already done Arduino development before and you're going to know what setup and loop do. Uh, and so I don't need comments explaining that, um, plus they just get in my way. So what we're going to do is uh, use uh, Visual Studio, Studio Code to actually do some coding, which is cool because of IntelliSense and its ability to start completing things for us. So as I type pin mode, for example, because we're going to say that um, D4 is going to be where the LED is, I can actually see that pin mode is, is uh, an actual function and notice as I do the open paren, it's actually showing me the options um, or parameters that I would pass, which is just awesome. So I'm going to say D4 and I'm going to say this is output and then down here in loop, I'm going to do digital write D4 high and then I'm going to say uh, delay, and then I'm going to say digital write D4 low, and we'll do another delay, and we uh, have our uh, hello world blink. So let's see if this compiles, so we'll do the same thing, and we'll say compile locally. And it's good, it looks like we have a good local compile. So the next thing is, is we want to be able to download this onto this device. And to do that, this needs to be in DFU mode. And putting it in DFU mode um, normally is kind of a pain in the butt because you have to put both fingers on the reset and setup and go through this process of kind of manhandling the device to get it into that mode. But I'm going to show you a trick. If you go over to the terminal and you say ls, dev cu star, you're going to see um, that there is a USB modem uh, with a number which actually turns out to be the same number most of the time. You can't always be confident of that, but very close. And notice that I can go up here and I can actually enter a command that tells that um, USB serial port to go to 14400. And when I do that, the firmware detects that and puts it in DFU mode. So now we've put it in DFU mode. Just by doing that, I don't need to actually handle the device to do it. Now I can go back and do my build command and I can say flash locally. And so we can watch what happens. It's going to download the code. And if we did it right, our light blinks, which it does. So that is our first use of Particle Studio, or Particle Workbench, I should say, and uh, we have a Hello World blinking light. So the next step is going to be plugging in our uh, sensor. So here we have the, um, the MCP9808, and we're going to connect it up and load a library. I'll show you how to do that, and away we go. So let's pick up from where we left off. And what I've done is I know nobody really wants me to watch me wire stuff up. So what I've already done is wired up basically power and ground to uh, the breadboard. 
and I've also wired up uh, the yellow line for SCL and the blue line for SDA. And that you'll find in many of my videos, I try to stick to those using red and black for power and ground and then using other colors for other signals. I tend to do yellow for clock um, and I tend to do a darker brown or blue for data. So we've left the LED in, we're still running that hello world. Now let's go in and add a library and see if we can talk to uh, the MCP 9808. So to do that, what we need to do is we actually need to load a library. And one of the things that we're gonna wanna do is be able to find the library first. And so the way we can do that is again, with command Apple P, um, I can launch the CLI. And when I launch the CLI, down here I can enter search commands for searching for particular libraries. So the way that we search for libraries is through the following command. We can say particle, libraries, search, and then uh, this is MCP 9808, so we could just type in MCP 9808 because that's probably going to be a name in a library. And when I search, I see that I end up with two libraries. And um, one of them here is just MCP 9808, and it has a score of uh, 4347. And then I have the Adafruit uh, 9808 uh, 1.0, but it has very low to no score, which means nobody's using it. So I'm always going to use the library that's sort of the highest ranking generally, because it's the one that's been most accepted by everybody and it shows the one that's most in use. So what we can do is then go back up here uh, and say particle um, include, I did the B, I did the build, I meant to do the P, and we're gonna say install library, and then we're gonna say MCP 9808 and hit enter. And now you'll see down here in the bottom right that it's doing an install of the library. And when this completes, over here on the left, you see that there's now a live directory. And then in here, MCP 9808, and it has some examples that we could jump in and look at to see how it's used, which is awesome. Uh, but it also has in here the source, and it has the header file, and it actually has the implementation as well. So, we're going to jump back into our code here, and we're gonna actually use this library. So we're gonna say include, and MCP 9808, and it's the .h file, and what we'll do is we'll create a object for this sensor. So we say MCP 9808, and we'll just call it uh, MCP, and that equals MCP 9808, open, close, print. So what this is doing is it's saying, uh, whoops. So this is saying that this variable is of this type, MCP 98, which is defined in the header file here, and that this is the constructor for the C++ class called MCP 9808, and we're constructing it at this point. And we're not gonna need to provide any parameters at this point. And then the other thing we're gonna do is, since we're gonna send some stuff up to the particle cloud, um, we're gonna wanna create a, sort of a string array and see we can do this really as a buffer. Uh, we'll just call it buffer and it's an array of characters, okay? Which would be like uint 8 ts. Now, one of the other things that we wanna do is we want to be able to use the external antenna. You'll notice over here, we are, I'm using the external antenna off the xenon. Now, at the time that uh, this is being recorded uh, in RC.27, there is no exposure to actually telling the Xenon to use the external antenna as part of um, its boot up process and so forth. However, Rick from support has given uh, us all the way to do it ourselves directly, and it's really writing to two um, digital I.O. pins that are not external that we can connect to on here, but are internal. And it turns out that you set the uh, ANT SW1 to a zero, and you set the ANT SW2 uh, 
2 to a 1. And when you do that in your setup, the net, when this runs, it's actually going to flip to the external antenna. And that's what we're going to want when we actually get into moving this away from the argons and putting it in the condo and trying it out and getting that distance. So that's, you know, we comment that as use external antenna. And then uh, the next thing we want to do is we want to initialize or actually fire up the MCP. And the way you do that is um, we're going to start by just saying mcp.begin. And this is sort of a little, you know, idiomatic uh, expression that is commonly done, which is to say, you know, um, we'll essentially, while the begin, so what happens is MCP begin will pass back a true or false, whether it succeeded in talking to the device. And if it did succeed in talking to the device, uh, it will go right on out of setup. Otherwise, it will try again in a half a second. And so that's a nice way to kind of fire things up. So uh, the next thing to do would be to see uh, if we actually leave this code, if we then download this code onto the device, we should be able to see if we get the blinking LED, um, which means I need to put this back. D4 is going to be an output. And um, why don't we compile this locally first? Let's just see if this compiles. So we'll run the compiler. And it looks like it all passed. So that looks good. So we want to download it onto the board. So remember what we do. We're going to go over here to our terminal. And we uh, have the STTY command. And so I'm going to do that command. <clears throat> so when I enter it, you see that we have gone into DFU mode. And now we can download. Uh, or flash the device. And so the theory is, is that if it initializes correctly with the MCP9808, once it comes out of setup and does that initialization, we should see a blinking light. And we do. So because the way this code is written, we wouldn't see that if this begin did not work. So it worked, so that's all thumbs up. That's looking good. So now we can take this out. And what we're going to do is get a temperature. So I'm going to say float temp mcp dot get temperature. And notice how this is all completing for me nicely. Um, and then I want to publish this temperature. So what we want to do is we actually want to put this into something like a string where it says temp is and then the actual temperature. <clears throat> and a great function to use to do that is the SNprintf. And what you can do is it's similar to printf, but what you can do is sort of give it the uh, string uh, buffer that you want the result to go into rather than printing to the console, and also give it a string and also give it a format for a variable that you want display. So if I say uh, buffer here is the first parameter, the second one is going to be the size of the buffer, and I'm going to use size of. And that way, if we change this to a 200 or a 300, this doesn't change here. We don't want to hard code it again. And then I'm going to say temp is, and we'll say percent %f for floating point, and temp, which is what we got right here. Okay. And then we want to publish this. So we can do particle.publish, and we can say uh, temp is the actual name of the um, message queue, if you will, that we're going to publish to. So if somebody else was subscribing to temp, they would be able to see what we sent. And we'll pass the buffer. And we'll do this, let's say, every five seconds. So again, uh, let's see if this compiles. Looks good. So let's go ahead and put our device in DFU mode, and then let's go back and flash it. Okay, so now it flashed, and in theory, it's sending this data up to the cloud. And so what we want to do now is go in and log in and see if we see it. So we'll go here 
to Safari, and I'm going to say console particle IO. And I'm going to go ahead and log in. And I'm not going to do two step right now. And here's Xenon 3, and if we click down into that and we wait a few seconds, we should see a publish of temp, and we do. So it shows it's a little warm in the lab right now, 26 and a half degrees Celsius, and it's sending it every uh, five seconds. So this is awesome. We have actually now um, are talking to the MCP, getting temperatures, sending them up to the cloud, and so now we know what we can hook into with the argon to get the temperature and display it on a display.